Hey everyone, how's it going? I hope you're all doing well, and I wish I could see you in person at events and conferences and things like that. But while we're working from home, I thought it'd be helpful to record a quick tech talk for you. So this talk is an introduction to deep learning, and it might be helpful if you've been doing machine learning for a little while, and you've been working with things like decision trees and random forests, and now you're curious how deep learning is different and what kinds of uh, new and important things you can develop with it. So here's a quick outline of what we'll cover. And we'll start with some interactive demos built using TensorFlow.js. And it's totally cool if you're not a JavaScript developer. I'm not, I primarily write Python. But the idea is to give you a flavor of what you can develop uh, with the field. And you can try all of these with a single click. Next, we'll take a look at what deep learning actually means and how the term fits in with things like AI and ML. And after that, we'll take a look at families of neural networks. And you'll learn about things like DNNs and CNNs and RNNs at a high level. And I'll point you to complete end-to-end -end code examples you can use for all of these that you can try in Colab, again, with a single click. Then we'll take a look at what a neural network actually is. And in this video, we'll look at the forward pass, meaning exactly what happens when you classify an image with the network. And you'll learn things like what a neuron is and what a dense layer is. And we'll take a peek at the math involved. And I, I promise you, it's not bad. It's just a matrix multiply. Then I'll show you a few code highlights. And by that, I mean, I'll pick a couple tutorials from the website. I'm not going to read the tutorial to you, don't worry. But I'll make some slides and highlight some important parts and see if I can add some value. And then finally, we'll take a look at some book recommendations. And I'll point you to a couple of my favorite books, and I think they might be helpful uh, to you as well. So let's get started. All right, so this is the first demo. And uh, this is an application called Face Mesh. And as you can see, it's tracking different key points on my face in real time. And what's really cool is this is running entirely in the browser. So no data is being sent to a server. It's done entirely client-side in JavaScript. And uh, what's really great, too, is there's an existing very accurate model for this, which means one avenue you have to develop with deep learning is actually build on top of an existing model rather than writing your own. And uh, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in this area because the field is, is still very young. And if you think about what you can do with a model like this, Right off the bat, you can imagine, you know, maybe if you have somebody who's perhaps movement impaired, you could develop an application that could let them control a mouse cursor, perhaps by moving their head or even blinking their eyes. And you can see that it actually detects uh, both eyes independently. So let's take a look at the next demo. OK, this is the second demo I'd like to show you. And as you can probably guess right off the bat, this is doing hand tracking in the browser using JavaScript. And just like the other one, this is happening entirely client side. No data is being sent to a server. So it's private, and you can see it's very fast. And uh, one point I'd like to make is deep learning is very interdisciplinary. So I'm a Python developer, and uh, for me as a Python developer to do something like this, I would have to capture a frame from the webcam, you know, send it to a server, do some analysis, send the frame back. And my solution would be very slow. But if you uh, partner with people uh, with skills that complement your own, then together you can develop really cool interactive applications like this. And now let's take a look at the third demo. OK, so the third demo we'd like to show you is called the Teachable Machine. And this is a great system to use if you're ever teaching a machine learning class yourself and you'd like to quickly show students uh, what a computer vision model can do. It takes just a minute to get started with, but uh, to keep this video short, I trained a uh, model in advance. And what that model is doing, if you look on the right side of your screen, it's detecting whether or not my hand is in the frame. So here you see class 1 indicates to the probability that the model thinks there's a hand there. And class 0 uh, indicates that there's no hand there. And you can train a binary classification model or multi-class, whatever you like. And um, you can do it interactively. It's, it's great. Highly recommend it. And you can learn uh, more about it at this link. OK, with those demos out of the way, let's take a look at what deep learning actually is. And I borrowed this diagram from the Deep Learning book by Ian Goodfellow and others. It's excellent. Um, it's one of the books I'll recommend later, but it's very much the math-heavy academic textbook and the other two are going to be practical and hands-on. Anyway, let's start by getting some of our terms straight. And roughly, there's three broad circles here. The outermost is AI, or artificial intelligence. The uh, second one is machine learning. And the uh, third and fourth are representation learning and deep learning, which are very closely related. So quickly, um, let's just run through what these mean. And normally, we would do this interactively. But AI uh, is the most general. And the difference between machine learning and deep learning is it doesn't say anything about how you solve problems. So for example, the way to do AI research is you think of a problem that people are very good at, but computers are currently bad at. And the classic example could be programming a computer to play chess. And you can solve that in any way you like, 
by writing a rule-based system or doing something like, you know, minimax tree search, but you can do it however you like. Machine learning is a fancy way of saying programming with data. And a classic example of machine learning would be something like linear regression, where you're trying to find the best fit line, or logistic regression, which is very similar, even though it sounds fancier, where you're trying to predict a value between zero and one. The idea of machine learning is that you can write one program to solve many problems. And uh, the way we do this, at least with deep neural networks, is we find useful values for weights and, uh, or a parameter. And what I mean by that is in linear regression, say your model is y equals mx plus b, doing machine learning means finding good values for m and b. Uh, there's a couple ways to do that, but uh, in deep learning land, we would do that using gradient descent. And we can train a deep neural network in a very similar way. So machine learning means finding good values for weights. Inside the machine learning family, in addition to things like logistic regression, we have really important techniques uh, like decision trees and random forests. And the reason that these are so important is there's broadly two classes of data that you work with in the machine learning world. And I think I have a slide on this a little bit later, but there's structured data and unstructured data. Basically, structured data means anything you can fit inside a spreadsheet or a simple CSV file. And unstructured data typically means things like an image where your features are the pixels from the image, or text where your features are the words or the characters, or sound, and so on and so forth. When you're trying to work with unstructured data, with things like a decision tree, you run into trouble. So if you, this is a little tricky without slides, but in your head, imagine what would happen if you tried to train a decision tree on features from an image. So imagine you're trying to train a model to identify cats versus dogs. And I give you an image. The features that you have to work with are just the raw pixel values. And imagine how wide and how deep that tree is going to be. Uh, the question the root node would have to ask would be something like, you know, is pixel 87 greater in intensity than 255? Or I'm sorry, that wouldn't make sense. Is pixel 87 greater in intensity than 100 or something? And these questions, they're not very sensible, and this wouldn't generalize very well, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. So uh, basically, to work with unstructured data with classical ML, and by that I mean uh, things like decision trees, you would have to spend a lot of time writing Python code to do feature extraction. So writing a Python script to extract features from the image, like is there a tail in this image, or is there an eye, and then feed those features to a decision tree. The problem is writing that feature extraction code is exhausting, it doesn't work very well, and um, we don't want to do it. And the good news is that we don't have to because we move forward into a field called representation learning. Representation learning is a fancy way of saying it's a class of machine learning techniques that automatically learn useful features from data. And this is so key, as you'll see um, in probably 10 slides or so. Basically, because we have a class of techniques that can learn features, we can apply the same algorithm to many different types of unstructured data. Uh, for example, images, text, sound, graphs. And that's unlocked um, incredible applications. And then we get into deep learning. And deep learning is synonymous with neural networks. The basic idea is that you have multiple layers of neurons, and each layer is learning a different type of representation. And we'll take a look at what that means uh, now. So here's a cartoon diagram of a deep neural network that we will dissect later. And up top, uh, we're looking at the unrolled pixels from an image. So maybe we have a grayscale image, and um, instead of working with the two-dimensional image, we've unrolled it into one long array or a vector. The reason we've done that is this network is composed of dense layers, or fully connected layers. Each circle corresponds to a neuron, and each row of circles corresponds to a layer. One limitation of dense layers is that they can only take vectors as input which is why we had to unroll the image. Um, these are also by far the most general type of layer, and it's what you'll learn to work with uh, first. The rough idea of deep learning is that we want to classify this image in terms of high-level features, but we don't want to have to write feature extraction code to learn those features ourselves. The last layer is the one that actually classifies the data, and there's one output for every class you can predict. So in my cartoon diagram, uh, we have nine outputs. So this is a, a nine-way, uh, say, image classifier. And each of these neurons is going to produce a score, and we'll classify the image by choosing the neuron with the highest score. Now, the trick to make this work is the intermediate layers. And what these do is they compute features as a function of their input. 
As you'll see in a bit, they're taking a linear combination of the input values and some learnable weights. And basically, the neurons in the first layer can compute combinations of pixel values. And if you think about what a combination of a pixel value might mean, it could be something like an edge. So roughly, the first layer learns to detect edges. Now, the second layer receives those edges as input. It never sees the raw pixels. And what's really special is if you think about what you get when you take combinations of lines or edges, you start to get simple shapes. So the second layer is computing shapes, which means the final layer, which has to classify the data, is doing so in terms of the shapes that the second layer has found. And that's what it means to do representation learning. And it's much, much easier to classify the image in terms of the shapes than it is in terms of the, the raw pixel values. The deep in deep learning comes from the fact that deeper neural networks tend to work better for many problems. And the reason is they learn hierarchical features. And this is easiest to understand with computer vision. The basic idea is that you can go from pixels to edges to shapes to textures to patterns. And if you have something like a 50 or even 100 layer neural network, and this is true too of smaller ones, you'll find that the later layers end up identifying features that are uh, semantic, things like eyes or uh, patterns from a peacock's tail. And what we're looking at here is um, the output of an experiment called uh, Deep Dream. Um, and Deep Dream is a way that helps us investigate what are the features that a deep neural network has learned to recognize in the process of training it. And what we've done here is visualized, or we've, we've started from an image that's random noise, and we've optimized the noise with gradient descent to excite uh, certain neurons or certain layers in the network. And on the far left, you can see that the early uh, layers are learning to detect uh, patterns that look like edges, basically. And then as we move forward, you can see that they become uh, much richer very quickly, uh, going all the way up. Some are quite beautiful, and some are a little bit trippy. As an aside, the reason that they're trippy is uh, I don't want to go on too long of a tangent, but this, this works by starting with a pre-trained image classifier. Uh, here it happens to be a convolutional neural network, and it was previously trained on a very large data set of images. After it was trained, we investigate the network to see what features it's learned to detect. Because that data set had lots of peacocks or animals with eyes, I guess all animals have eyes, many animals have eyes, uh, but it's, uh, we're seeing things that were in the data set, and, um, and that's why we see these sort of psychedelic images. Okay, so the good news is I do have two slides on structured and unstructured data. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's important for you to understand. And the thing that I want to take away from, and you can read these slides if you want more detail, but basically, many business problems boil down to working with structured data. And the truth is, things like uh, gradient boosted trees and basically the decision tree family of algorithms performs extremely well and they beat uh, deep neural networks in many cases, especially if you have a small amount of data. Another huge, huge advantage of tree-based models is that you can print out the tree and you can understand exactly how that model works and you can translate that into actionable business logic. Um, it's, a, it's a misconception that deep neural networks are opaque, um, but they're certainly more difficult to interpret than trees. And um, basically, if you're new to this whole machine learning thing, it's absolutely worth your time to um, study tree-based models before you get into deep neural networks because you're going to need them um, in most fields that you're going to be working in. Anyway, roughly, um, this is how your workflow changes. The, uh, the difference um, in deep learning, as I said a couple times, is you don't have to spend all this time writing feature extraction code. And this is hugely, hugely valuable because, as always, we value our time more than we value uh, compute time. And more importantly, we want to be able to work with data that we can't extract features from maybe like molecular graphs. And I'll show you a cool example of that in a few slides. So at this point, for a change of pace, I'd like to show you a couple examples of what the code looks like for different types of deep neural networks in TensorFlow 2. And the good news is you can express uh, many of these in just about um, you know, one to five lines of code. Um, understanding, I like to say that um, deep learning has gotten to the point where it's, at least with high-level APIs, where it's code light but concept heavy. So the time it takes you to understand the code is a lot less than the time it will take you to understand what all the um, involved uh, concepts are. And that's totally cool. Anyway, um, if we wanted to have a model for something like linear regression, a linear regression model in deep learning land is a single neuron. And here's how we would express that in TensorFlow 2. It's a dense layer with one neuron and no activation function. The activation function changes the value that comes out of this neuron. And I, have, I have slides for that later for you. 
If we wanted to do logistic regression, uh, we would change just a half a line of code, and we'd add an activation function. In this case, we're adding a sigmoid function, which is a squashing function. What it does is it squashes the output of the neuron to a value between 0 and 1, which you can interpret as a probability. And right off the bat, I wanted to mention um, that deep learning is very interdisciplinary. Um, it borrows from heavily from statistics and computer science and other fields. And it's important to um, be able to find partners, basically, or friends who complement your strengths and your weaknesses. So my training was in computer science. I'm a developer. And it's been about 20 years since I took a statistics course. So when I say you can interpret this as a probability, what I mean is that to me, as a developer, it looks like a probability. It's a number that ranges between 0 and 1. But whether or not you should go to Vegas and bet proportional to that probability is a question you would want to carefully analyze with a statistician before you made a decision like that. So as a developer, I interpret this as a rough confidence score. Anyway, um, we can also easily do things like multinomial logistic regression or softmax regression. And here, if you take a look at that layer, we now have 10 outputs, uh, which means we're producing 10 numbers. And we could use this for you know, a multi-class classification problem. If you were training a model to tell you whether an image is a cat, a dog, a zebra, a sheep, or so on and so forth, that softmax activation function means that it squashes the output of all 10 neurons such that each individual number ranges between 0 and 1, and they sum to 1. So again, this looks like a probability distribution. But without talking to a statistician first, I would interpret this as a rough confidence score. If you'd like to train a neural network, you can add a single line of code. And now we have two dense layers, each of which has learnable weights. And the intuition here is that the first layer, in this case, is going to learn a representation for the data. In this case, that's taking pixels as input if we're doing image classification. And it's going to be emitting um, activations or features that hopefully represent uh, edges. And the next layer is the one that actually classifies the data. And regardless of what other layers you add to the network, the way to start reading and interpreting what these do is always by looking at the very last layer. So regardless of how many layers we have above that, this is still emitting uh, 10 numbers in a probability-like distribution. And we'll talk about what that ReLU means uh, later. That 128, um, that number I pulled out of a hat. I'm a computer scientist. I like multiples of two. Uh, you could use other numbers as well. The rough intuition is that the higher that number, the more types of uh, patterns that layer can learn. So maybe it can learn to detect. Um, in this case, these dense layers happen to be position sensitive, which is one reason why they're inefficient. But it can detect 128 different types of edges at a certain location. Um, if you made that 256, it could, it could detect more edges. And it might be true that those uh, multiples of two fit more neatly into GPU memory. But um, yeah, mostly they're pulled out of a hat. Um, one thing to be aware of at this point is deep learning is really rich in hyperparameters. And a hyperparameter is a fancy word for saying a parameter of the model that you have to tune. So for example, the number of neurons per layer is a hyperparameter. And oftentimes, deep learning is experimental. And the way to find out good values for the problem that you care about is by running a simple experiment, so trying different values and seeing how well they work. And we have different tools like Keras Tuner that can help you do that more efficiently than guess and check. If you want to train a deep neural network, we add a, uh, another line of code. So uh, now we have two layers that are learning features and one layer that's classifying the data. And that's, that's deep learning using TensorFlow's beginner API. Um, none of this is beginner level. But by beginner API, I mean this is our neatest way, our most concise way of writing code. We also have nitty gritty stuff you can check out as well. And just for fun, this is a deeper neural network. As you'll see a little bit later in this talk, this boils down to a sequence of matrix multiplies. The reason that we have an activation function like ReLU after every layer that's computing features is um, if you remember from your linear algebra class, and if you don't, it's totally OK, if you have a sequence of matrix multiplies, you can reduce those to a single mat mole. And adding a nonlinearity like ReLU prevents that from happening. So basically, without the ReLU, these layers are unable, without the nonlinearity, these layers are unable to learn uh, features, and they, they end up doing nothing useful. So we have to have that to, so it doesn't boil down to a single, single mat mole. And um, this slide is just showing you again that the way to interpret what these things are doing is to look at the last layer. And if you want to pause it, there's a couple examples there that you can, you can check out. All right, before we get into the next section, I just have one more important slide to show you. The truth is, the skills that are important in classical ML are all still important in deep learning. Although this talk is about um, what neural networks are themselves and what the code looks like, the truth is, 
the skills that are important in your career, defining the model, and by that I mean actually figuring out what your DNN looks like, how many layers, the neurons per layer, that's the smallest part of the puzzle. The things that are really important are carefully thinking about the problem you want to solve, carefully collecting a diverse and representative data set, um, carefully evaluating it, carefully testing it. It's really what you want to, where you want to get to in your career is thinking through the end-to-end -end problem that you're trying to solve. So how will this help a user or how, this will, how, how will your work help somebody and how will it be used in practice? And um, thinking about the model is one part of that, but it's important to focus on the entire problem and develop those skills as you go. And just for fun, I put some ballpark numbers here. And roughly this is showing the impact of these, these different areas of this end-to-end -end problem solving process. And I'm just trying to illustrate that writing the actual code for the model is, is a small part. A really key example of this uh, is this paper. And this is a screenshot, which is, I think, about six months out of date now. But it's a screenshot of the uh, JAMA homepage. And JAMA is the Journal of the American Medical Association. And what this is showing us is that the most heavily cited paper in the last three years was a paper using deep learning by Lily Peng's group to uh, basically predict whether a picture of a retina is diseased or healthy at a really high level. The huge contribution of this paper, although this was a problem in computer vision, but her group didn't have to reinvent a brand new deep neural network to do computer vision. They used an existing architecture and they thoughtfully applied it to a new domain with a really rigorous evaluation and um, they had enormous impact. So there's a lot of code, of course, they had to write to make this all work. But what I'm trying to show you is that a lot of the value in deep learning is finding new domains, particularly in healthcare and hopefully in, in medicine, things like drug discovery, where you can apply this technology basically to new data sets and new types of problems. You need to understand these networks very well, but you don't need to have a PhD in computer vision to apply them to do something really helpful. So now let's take a look at a few different families of neural networks. And my goal for this section is just to introduce some of the terminology and uh, to make sure you know where to look for code examples if you're interested in any of these topics. And all of the code examples I'll point you to have complete end-to-end -end code to solve a simple illustrative problem. So, so far we've looked at dense neural networks and these are the, um, or DNNs. And these are the most general type because they take vectors as input. And you can absolutely work with structured data in deep learning. And this is a simple example, or maybe not so simple, of doing regression uh, with a DNN. And the idea is that you start with a data set uh, with features describing a car. So the horsepower, the weight, maybe the year it was made, and you try and predict the miles per gallon. And this tutorial linked at the bottom will show you how to solve this in a couple different ways. The next family of neural networks that's really popular today is convolutional neural networks. And these are extremely well suited for image classification. There's a link on the bottom where you can train an end-to-end -end tutorial that uh, classifies flowers. What I really like about this is uh, it starts from a zip file which is just a zip of a bunch of different types of flowers. So if you want to customize this to work with your own data, um, you can basically change the zip file and the rest of the tutorial will mostly work. Um, convolutional neural networks, uh, they're much more efficient uh, than uh, dense layers, um, and which basically means that we can use them to learn a deeper feature hierarchy. But we'll get into that in the future. Oh, one thing I can say about convolution, you can also use them for audio classification. And so, so far, all that you know is they work for images. And um, uh, this means that uh, we, can, we can classify short sounds in a relatively simple way. So, for example, uh, one way to represent sound is by taking a Fourier transform and representing it as an image. And we can feed images for different phrases through a CNN, and we can classify the sound as if it was a picture. And uh, that's a trick, and we've got a tutorial for sound classification on the website you can check out as well. And just for fun, I wanted to show you a code snippet of what the code looks like in TensorFlow for a CNN. And the goal here is not to understand what all these different layers do, but it's just to get a sense for the flavor of the code that you might be looking at. And here, there's a couple things you can look at. At the top of the screen, we see that we have a stack of convolutional layers and max pooling layers. And roughly what these do is, again, they're extracting features from data. So they're going from the pixels to something that's more useful to work with. At the bottom of the network, we have a layer called uh, flatten. And flatten, there's no machine learning in flatten. It basically takes uh, whatever's above it and flattens it down into a vector. Because remember, dense layers always take vectors as input. And then the final dense layer tells us that it's classifying, this is basically doing 10-way image classification with a softmax output. One thing to be aware of that's extremely cool is transfer learning. 
And the idea in transfer learning is it, it tries to answer a really important question in machine learning, which is how can you reuse the knowledge that you've learned on a previous task for a new task? So in the case of image classification, you can imagine that maybe you've spent a few months training a really large image classifier on a huge data set with millions of images and thousands of output classes. And now you want to customize that model to work with a new, much smaller data set. And the emphasis is on small data. So the number one thing when you're training these models is more data is always better. And the truth is we never have enough data. We always want more. And so maybe you want to you know, uh, train a model to classify your cat from your dog for whatever reason. And let's say you have only 50 photos of each of those. With transfer learning, you can lightly customize the features learned by a convolutional neural network to work with uh, new data. Roughly, there's two ways you can go about this. You can perform surgery on the network, and you can basically delete the dense layer. So if I go back a slide, just for illustration, you can imagine that I've previously trained this whole network to classify 10 things. I can delete the dense layer if I want and add a new dense layer just for my two classes. And I can leave the previous layers unchanged. So I'm going to use them to extract the features that they've learned previously. And I'll just use those, I'll feed those features to my dense layer. And uh, this means that I can train a model very quickly and I can train it on a small amount of data. So transfer learning is just a very impactful, uh, cool field to be aware of. The next type of model are recurrent neural networks or RNNs. And RNNs are specialized to work with sequences. So basically, DNNs work with vectors, CNNs are convolutional neural networks, basically work with images, and RNNs work with sequences. So what is sequence data? And there's a couple examples. Let's start by taking a look at text. Text you can think of as a sequence of characters or words. And there's roughly two things you can do with that. There's the important one, which is the more boring of the two, but it's the one that's much more practical. And this is text classification. So on the left, we're looking at a model that can take a movie review as input, and it can classify the movie review as positive or negative. The second thing you can do is text generation. And here we have an example where we have a database of Shakespeare's plays, and we train an RNN uh, to generate new text that looks as if it was written by Shakespeare. The, um, this is a very simple model, and although the text sounds like Shakespeare, and it even looks like Shakespeare, if you read it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make any sense, and it's actually kind of hilarious. Another really important application of RNNs is time series forecasting. And there's lots of examples of this. Um, one could be if you want to predict uh, the weather. And so imagine you have a database of maybe the temperature, pressure, and humidity for the last week of weather, and you want to predict the temperature tomorrow. You could train a RNN to do this. And just so you know, there's a couple different types of RNNs. You may have heard of models like LSTMs or GRUs, and these fall into the RNN uh, bucket. You can also use RNNs for financial modeling, but I would encourage you, if you're new to this field, to spend your time um, on applied applications, particularly in healthcare and medicine. I'm a huge fan of those, as you can tell, and I think that's really where the, um, the value is for the next five years. One amazing example of RNNs, it's, you can also use them for uh, fun and games. And this is a really, really cool interactive demo that you can try. There's a link at the bottom. I'd encourage you to give it a spin. And this is using an RNN for drawing generation. And if you think of what a drawing is, a drawing is a sequence of brush strokes. So you can imagine someone picks up a pen and she moves it from point to point on the screen. And there's a database that contains um, all those vectors for the drawings. And here an RNN has been trained to produce sketches similar to what it's uh, seen before. And this means you can begin drawing uh, simple things like maybe a truck or a plane, and the uh, RNN artist will attempt to auto-complete your drawings. It's sort of uh, the beginning of what could be uh, fun applications. And you know, maybe I get writer's block sometimes. It could be that if uh, you're an artist and you get artist block, this could maybe help you with inspiration or something like that. There's another important family of uh, uh, deep neural networks called encoder decoders. And this is where a lot of the really amazing applications are. Another way to think of representation learning is you're taking a piece of unstructured data and you're compressing it into a vector. And I know this sounds crazy, um, but if you, if you flip back like 40 slides and you think of that picture of the fully connected cartoon deep neural network, the way to think about it is the input to the first layer is very high dimensional. It's the pixels from the image. The layer that that feeds into has a smaller number of neurons than there are pixels in the image. And what that means is the output of that layer is a representation for the image. Another way of saying this is it's an embedding for the image. It's a vector of numbers that describes the information in the image. Likewise, the next layer in the network is another image embedding 
or another representation for the image. And typically, the number of parameters in these networks um, shrinks as we go uh, deeper down in them, which basically means we're compressing an image or a piece of unstructured data as we go. It's very similar to a concept like a word embedding, except we're not limited to just embedding words. Of course, we can embed text. It sounds crazy. And what's, what's kind of miraculous about this, it's um, not a miracle in the sense that it's, it's divine, but it's miraculous in the sense that it works in a way that our intuitions wouldn't suggest. The fact that via gradient descent, we can train a model to compress images is extraordinary. And um, it works way better than my, my uh, intuition would, would tell me that it should. Um, anyway, let's, let's keep going with this. A great example of an encoder decoder is something like machine translation. And at the bottom, you can find complete code to do this. We have a, um, we borrowed a small data set and it's a parallel corpus. So it's sentences in English followed by their Spanish translation. And with nothing else, we can use representation learning to train an encoder, which is RNN based, to take a sentence in English and compress it into a vector. So, so most of the information in that sentence gets compressed into the vector. Then we can, and that, that vector is a representation of you know, uh, what was said. Anyway, the, that's the encoder. The decoder takes that vector and decompresses it into Spanish. So vector, so English sentence in, vector out, vector in, Spanish sentence out. That's mind blowing. And what's really special about this is there's nothing in the code that says anything about English or Spanish. You can swap the database out so you can go from Spanish to English if you like, just by reversing the order. Other cool things you can do, if you also have a parallel corpora of English to French, you can include that. And you can train a single encoder decoder, which can translate from English or French into Spanish in the same model. It's extraordinary. Another thing that's kind of mind blowing is something like image captioning. And the important thing about this example is you can mix and match different types of layers. So here we have a CNN, which compresses an image into a vector. We feed that vector into a RNN, which then generates a sentence that describes the image. And here the diagram is showing you it's a picture of a surfer riding a wave and the RNN is emitting a sentence that looks like a surfer riding a wave. Mind blowing. This is called image captioning and there's complete code for it below. And then finally, we have things like autoencoders, uh, which is also written as an encoder decoder. And this is the code that I will walk you through when we do a screencast after I finish presenting these slides. So we'll come back to this. Um, if you're interested, I'd encourage you to check it out. The basic idea here is that it's been trained on a uh, toy data set of ECG data and we're trying to identify anomalous uh, heart rhythms, basically. Another family of deep learning that's extremely cool is GANs, or Generative Adversarial Neural Networks. And here, we're looking at something called a conditional GAN. It's a model called pix to pix out of Berkeley, and you give the model a uh, block diagram of maybe a storefront, or maybe the front of a building like a hotel. And the model emits a picture which uh, looks like it could correspond to that block diagram. So this is basically trained on a data set of block diagrams and their corresponding pictures. And then you give the model a new block diagram and it emits a new picture. And what's really neat about this is um, if you think about most of the applications in classical ML are classification and regression. So predict a class or predict a probability or a number. This is a generative model and it's much, much harder to uh, predict an entire image than it is to predict a single number. But again, this, this can be trained via um, gradient descent. And um, there's really two neural networks that are being trained jointly. There's a uh, generator, which uh, generates images, as you might expect, and there's a discriminator. And its job is to say whether an image generated by the generator is real or fake. And as we train these jointly, over time, the generator gets better at generating real looking images. And the discriminator gets better at telling real images from fake until they reach equilibrium. And we uh, sadly can dispose of the discriminator since we no longer need it. <laughs> but we can keep the generator and we can use it to generate um, really cool looking uh, photos. Finally, there's one key, key field of deep learning that I'd like to introduce you to. And so far we've seen DNNs, CNNs, and RNNs. And these are all relatively uh, mature. Um, RNNs, if you're curious, have been around since the late 90s. Anyway, uh, the new thing is called GNNs, or graph neural networks. And the reason I'm very excited about these is there's lots of types of data that you can represent as a graph. It's an incredibly general data structure. A really important type is a molecular graph. And in this example, and you can check out the paper below, what the authors did is they trained a GNN to basically predict whether a molecule has antibiotic properties. 
So this is a binary classifier. Is it an antibiotic or not? After they trained a model on a supervised data set, they applied it to something called the Drug Repurposing Hub, which is a large database of drugs. And they were able to find a drug in the database that had uh, antibacterial properties, but was not previously known to be an antibiotic. And again, just like all the other areas of deep learning, the reason this is so important and so um, effective uh, is that it can, a graph, a molecular graph is a very complex thing. And instead of writing a bunch of Python code to extract features from the graph, you can feed the raw data structure to a GNN, which will learn a representation for a graph. And this means as long as you have the data set, you can use basically the same code to train a model to predict you know, antibiotic properties or antiviral properties or whatever you want. Um, so uh, it's a little bit less mature than some other areas, but I, I have very high hopes that this is gonna be useful in the, uh, in the near future. So now let's take a quick look at whether neural networks are opaque. And by that I mean, are they difficult to interpret? And the answer is sort of, but we're making, we're making strong progress. So one thing you've already seen is deep dream. And uh, there's two categories of techniques I'd like to show you. Um, deep dream is something that we can use to interpret the types of features that the network is learning to recognize. And next I'll point you at a technique called integrated gradients that we can use to explain the predictions of a neural network for one example at a time. So here we're starting with an image of random noise and via gradient ascent, which maybe we'll look at in a different talk, we progressively modify the image to increasingly excite a layer in the network or a neuron in the network. And if you're interested in this, there's two really good code examples below. One is on tensorflow.org and one is on keras.io. These websites are parallel in many ways and oftentimes the examples are written a little bit differently. So for topics that interest you, I would encourage you to check out both and you'll have two solid references to help you uh, get started. Anyway, if you see the banana, the first thing we're doing is optimizing the image to excite a neuron. And if you look at the picture of the dog with a bunch of psychedelic uh, eyes and whatnot on it, in that example, we're optimizing the image to excite an entire layer. So we're seeing all of the features that the layer learns to detect at once. Maybe more practically useful um, is a technique called integrated gradients. And this helps us explain or justify uh, a single prediction of a DNN. And the idea here is that here we're doing, or you know, whatever type of neural network, it can be a CNN, it doesn't matter, a neural network. Here what we're doing is image classification. And we've given our network a picture of a fireboat in the San Francisco Bay. And the model has correctly classified it as a fireboat. Our next step is to ask the question, why did the model think this was a fireboat as opposed to another output class? And here on the bottom, we can see that um, this technique has highlighted the pixels that were important to the model's decision. And here you'll see that it's highlighting the water spouts. And uh, presumably, fireboats shoot water. It's these water spouts that enable the model to distinguish fireboats from non-fireboats. And um, right off the bat, this can raise useful questions to you when you're thinking about how your models work. You can imagine that there's plenty of pictures of fireboats that are not spouting water. And so you might want to investigate whether your model can correctly classify those as well. And something to keep in mind too, there's a huge difference between this and doing something with like printing out a decision tree. When you print out the decision tree, you understand how the entire model works. All we can do with integrated gradients is explain predictions one at a time, but it's still very useful in practice. Okay, so now let's take a quick look inside a neural network. And in uh, today's talk, we'll cover the forward pass. And what I mean by that is exactly what happens when you classify an image uh, with the network. So you can see every part. And um, our goal will be to make this diagram more concrete. So as a refresher, this is a cartoon diagram of a deep neural network. Each uh, layer corresponds, each row rather, corresponds to a layer of neurons. Here we have, uh, and every line corresponds to a learnable weight. So here we have three layers of learnable weights. And the depth of the network corresponds to uh, the depth of the feature hierarchy that the network can learn. And the width of each of the layers corresponds to the number of patterns of a given type that the network uh, can learn. So now let's take a closer look at what exactly an individual neuron is. And this is um, a diagram of a neuron and I've showed it in a couple ways. The first uh, with a line diagram and the second with um, an equation. And we have two equations here written in different ways, depending on whether you're, uh, when the last time is that you took a math course involving vectors. Anyway, on the um, left of the screen, uh, what we're looking at is a series of inputs, um, x0, x1, and so on. And these correspond, say, to pixel values that you're feeding into the network. Um, each input has a corresponding weight, uh, theta0, theta1, and so on and so forth. 
A weight is a tunable parameter, um, exactly like m or b in the linear regression example, y equals mx plus b. And the idea is they're initialized to small random values and we adjust them over time with gradient descent. The way the neuron computes an output value is it takes a dot product or the summation of every input multiplied by every weight and we sum that up. And that gives us a single value between positive and negative infinity. The simplest thing you can do is stop there. And there's an activation function that I'll describe later that I've crossed out for now. So let's just stop there with that value. And right there, you have a binary classifier. And you can say that if that value is greater than zero, the image is a cat. And if it's uh, less than zero, it's a dog or something like that. So a single neuron you can think of as a binary classifier, or you can even think of it as doing linear regression, um, predicting a single number. And just to make it concrete, here's another way of looking at exactly that same neuron. Uh, this time with some numbers filled in so you can follow the math uh, exactly. On the left side of the screen, we're looking at the input image to this neuron. And here, let's say it's a grayscale image of a, of a sweatshirt, and you can see the pixel values uh, filled in. If you look at the column X, those are the inputs to the neuron. And we've talked a little bit about the flatten layer, and here you can see that image has been unrolled into this column. W corresponds to a learnable uh, matrix of weights. And here, because we have a single neuron, it's just a row. And you'll see how this uh, is expanded uh, in a couple slides. And we're adding a bias. And the forward pass of this neuron is Wx plus b. I'm trying to build up from like y equals mx plus b. So here's y equals Wx plus b. Uh, you can also see the cartoon diagram on the top right of the slide, uh, how this neuron is starting to look already like a little neural network. Now let's see what happens if we add an activation function. And oftentimes you don't want a value between negative infinity and positive infinity. You want something that looks like a probability. So a common activation function you might apply to this is something like sigmoid. And where there's no machine learning, it's just a squashing function that takes the value and squashes it to be between 0 and 1. And if you do that, uh, now you have a little logistic regression unit. It's emitting a value between 0 and 1, which you can interpret as a probability. So now let's go from a neuron to a layer. And this is a cartoon diagram of a dense or a fully connected layer. And you can see that what a layer is is a row of neurons. And each of these neurons has a learnable weight connected to all of the inputs. So if I asked you how many weights were in this layer, you would say the number of neurons multiplied by the number of inputs, plus one bias for every neuron. And um, the thing to remember is um, this is very expensive, especially when you have uh, large inputs or wide layers. And also, you can see the equation on the bottom there that corresponds to this layer. Um, so the equation for a fully connected dense layer is basically Wx plus b. And we're applying a softmax to that to squash it to a probability distribution. Now let's continue building up our cartoon uh, network. So here, if you look on the top right corner of the screen, you'll see that we have two outputs. So this is a fully connected layer with uh, composed of two neurons. And the only thing that's changed is that we have another matrix of weights, uh, which corresponds to the trainable weights for the second neuron. And we have a second bias as well. Instead of doing a dot product like we were doing before, now we're doing a matrix multiply. And you can see on the right that now we have uh, two binary classifiers. One is telling us, is it a plane? And one is telling us, is it a car? What's really cool about this is you can see already that to forward an image through a layer, we're doing a matrix multiply. And as you may know, GPUs are extremely fast at doing uh, matrix multiplies, and they can do a bunch of them in parallel. And that's why we have this close relationship between accelerators like GPUs and even TPUs and, uh, and deep learning. That's where that comes from. Along those same lines, let's continue to um, build up this idea. And here what we've done is we've expanded the batch size. And what this means is now we have two images that we want to classify at once, still with a single matrix multiply. We also have an additional row of weights. And what that means is in a single mat mole, we're getting uh, three predictions for every image. And oftentimes, the reason that you'll see a large batch size, and the default in Keras is uh, 32, um, there's reasons for gradient descent. The larger the batch size, the more accurate your gradients. But another important reason is that because GPUs can multiply uh, many numbers in parallel, you can often uh, forward multiple images at once through the GPU in the same time that it would take you to forward a single one. So a larger batch size gives us more accurate gradients, and it's also more efficient. So now let's take a look at uh, what happens when we have the, uh, the second layer. And if you remember, we talked a little bit about uh, the importance of a nonlinear activation function. 
which sounds fancy, but the basic idea is to help each layer uh, learn something distinct so the whole thing doesn't resolve into a single matrix multiply. What's cool is to add a neural network, all we'll have to do is apply nonlinearity, and then we'll have another layer of learnable weights. This also brings me to the importance of, uh, of naming things. You can imagine that if neural networks, if, if instead of deep learning, which is th this really mysterious, uh, catchy, powerful sounding word, if instead you know, neural networks were uh, called like sequential matrix multiplication, uh, probably the field <laughs> would, have been, <laughs> would have been a little less attractive to some people. Anyway, here's how we go to a neural network. We take the output of that dense layer and we apply a nonlinearity, which here I'm calling G. And there's a bunch of these uh, nonlinearities. And as the slide is showing you, we're going to multiply this by another matrix, and that will give us a neural network. There's a, a whole bag of these nonlinearities. And every six months or so, there's another paper showing another one. And I just want to say a few words. The first is that a really good default, and that you'll see in pretty much all of our code examples, is, is ReLU. And um, let's just talk briefly about uh, why that's the case. So the first nonlinearity that you'll see is probably sigmoid. And again, that's the squashing function, which takes a number and whatever it is and squashes it to be between 0 and 1. And we really like that because sigmoid feels intuitive and it feels natural to us. It gives us um, a number that looks like a probability. The challenge is, and this is something that's only obvious um, in retrospect, is if you look at the gradient of sigmoid, so here in blue, you can see the uh, sigmoid, the output of sigmoid for some value. And here in orange, you can see the, the gradient. The issue is that sigmoid saturates. If you look at sigmoid of a very large number, like 9999, or a very small number, you'll see that uh, the function becomes basically flat. And so does the gradient. And the gradient is also less than 1. The problem is, if you think about, I know we haven't talked about backpropagation at all, but roughly what happens is the gradient is backpropagated or moves backward through the network. And the issue is that you're doing some multiplications using the chain rule along the way. And basically it boils down to when you're multiplying very small numbers uh, together, uh, you get an even smaller number. And that can often uh, go towards zero, which basically means that the gradients um, for uh, weights very early in the network are super small. And as a consequence, those layers uh, become slow to train. So basically, there's something called the vanishing gradient problem, um, which, which comes from activation functions like sigmoid. Uh, there's another activation function which, which looks quite counterintuitive, which is ReLU. And ReLU, basically, if the number is uh, less than 0, then it becomes 0. And if it's greater than 0, it passes through unchanged, which looks a little silly. Um, this is way less intuitive, but it basically functions as an on-off switch. But it avoids things like the vanishing gradient problem, and it tends to work much better in practice. So this is why ReLU is, is uh, used. And um, I actually have a demo of this that I'll show you in TensorFlow Playground. Uh, what I'll show you is what will happen if you, um, if you don't use activation functions at all versus if you do. Basically, without activation functions, the, um, the network can't learn uh, nonlinear functions. So just to make it concrete, let's take a look at exactly how you would apply ReLU to the output of a dense layer. And on the, uh, in the center, um, you can see some values emitted by the dense layer. And on the right, you can see uh, how these values are changed by ReLU. So 130 stays 130, negative 11 becomes 0, and 12 stays 12. And that's, that's all there is to it. Other activation functions like softmax will take into account all of the outputs and then normalize them. And again, I know I'm repeating this, but just so you remember, softmax will take a distribution and change it to a probability distribution. So all the numbers are between 0 and 1, and they sum to 1. And then if you want a deep neural network, this pattern continues. Uh, we apply a nonlinear activation function to the output of our neural network. Again, that can be ReLU. We multiply it by a number by another uh, matrix of weights. And so basically, again, with these fully connected uh, deep neural networks, deep learning is basically a series of matrix multiplications. Anyway, I have another demo I'd like to show you in TensorFlow Playground. And this is just the simplest demo I could think of of representation learning. And uh, here's what we're going to cover. Just off the bat, there's, there's no way to know the answer to this problem unless you're much better at math than I am or you've seen it before. But the, um, the thought experiment is basically you can look at these uh, two circles. We have a circle of purple dots on the exterior and a circle of green dots on the interior. And the question is, how can you draw a line to separate the purple dots from the green dots? And if you think about it, there's, there's no way to draw a line to separate them because they're not linearly separable. 
But if you've taken machine learning class before, you know that you can uh, do this via feature engineering. And um, there's a trick you can do. And the trick is to add a new feature. And we're going to call this Z. And the idea basically is if you, um, if you look at the dots around the exterior, if you square a value, that value is always positive. So we know the sum of the squares of the x and y coordinates for the dots around the outer circle is always greater than the sum of the squares for the x and y coordinates for the dots on the inner circle. So we can add a new feature z, which is the x coordinate squared plus the y coordinate squared. And the effect of adding z doing feature engineering is that we lift the outer circle away from the inner. And now instead of drawing a line, you can draw a plane that separates the data. Basically, the challenge with doing feature engineering like this by hand is that it's fine for toy problems like this, but it doesn't work great, you know, of course, for things like actual image classification. So we need a way to do this automatically. And that's what a neural network does, and I'll show you that now. Okay, so now I'd like to show you a demo of representation learning in action. And this is a piece of software called TensorFlow Playground. You can find it at playground.tensorflow.org. And it's a neural network you can train in your browser um, through a GUI. The interface is a little bit complicated, and let's start by simplifying it a little bit. Here you can see that you can select different types of classification problems to solve. And on the left, and this one looks a little bit similar to the slides, you'll see that we have uh, two circles. We have a circle of blue dots in the center, and we have a circle of orange dots um, around the periphery. And our goal is to learn a function to classify the data. In the center here, we can see the neural network. And um, it's a little complicated, but the idea is on the left are the inputs that we're feeding to the model. And x1 and x2 corresponds to the x and y coordinate on the screen. In the center, we have uh, two hidden layers. And on the right, you can see the classification result. To train this thing, if I hit play, we'll give it a second, and uh, the neural network will learn how uh, to separate the data. But I'd like to show you feature engineering. So let's reset this. And I'm going to simplify this a little bit by deleting the hidden layers. And after we've done this, we have a linear model or a single neuron. And now, um, as we talked a little bit about, if you feed in just the x and y coordinates, there's no way to draw a line to separate the blue dots from the orange dots. And if you hit play, you'll see that the model will fail. It won't be able to do it. But you can do feature engineering very similar to what we talked about in the slides. You can add new features like the x coordinate squared and the y coordinate squared. And now, if you train the model, the linear model can separate the data. And that's because it's, it's uh, basically lifted the orange dots um, up on the screen, and it's drawing a plane to separate the orange from the blue. But of course, uh, feature engineering is not something we want to do in the real world when we're dealing with high dimensional data like pictures of cats and dogs. And this is uh, what makes neural networks so amazing. So now if we add a hidden layer, and here I'm adjusting the width of the layer, and you can see on the left, I've removed these fancy features, and we're using only the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate. Now, if we train this, because of the hidden layer, it will automatically learn features like x squared and y squared, and it can use those to separate the data. So that's the magic of feature engineering or representation learning of deep learning in action. Now let's talk a little bit about the importance of nonlinearities. As you've seen or are going to see, what one of these dense layers basically boils down to, it boils down to a matrix multiplication. And a deep neural network is a series of matrix multiplications followed by a nonlinear activation function. The reason which you can see up top, and here tan h is selected, but usually it can be sigmoid or ReLU or whatever you like. The reason we have the nonlinearity is to help every layer learn something distinct. Without the nonlinearity, a sequence of matrix multiplies can be reduced to a single mat mole. Basically, so that's saying that the, um, the hidden layers don't help you learn anything new. So if we train this neural network with the nonlinearity, just as a quick demo, you'll see it's able to separate the data. But if we remove it, and on TensorFlow Playground, linear uh, corresponds to none, and now we train our fancy DNN, even though it has these hidden layers, it's unable to find a line to separate the data it's basically broken. And um, that's because these layers are learning nothing new. So that's why we need nonlinearities. So now let's take a look at a couple of code walkthroughs. And before we do that, let's, um, let's just take a quick look at what a neural network library like TensorFlow really is. And the basic idea is that there's a few ingredients. The first is that um, 
And these are true of most machine learning libraries. First of all, they tend to be similar to NumPy. And the question I'd like to ask students is, why is Python so popular for scientific computing, especially when it's, when it's uh, so slow compared to a language like C? And there's lots of reasons. You know, one can be it has a great ecosystem of tools, which is incredibly important. But another really important reason are libraries like NumPy, which basically let you run um, numerical computations like matrix multiplies in C, uh, but you can call them via Python. So the idea is to give you the best of both worlds. You get C performance, but Python ease of use. And um, neural network libraries, you can roughly think of as NumPy plus GPU support. So we also want to do those very fast matrix multiplications from Python, but now we want to do them on GPUs to get even more of a speed up. The other thing that neural network libraries have is uh, auto diff. So always, 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 we train neural networks by gradient descent. We get the gradients with backpropagation. Uh, the way we you know, uh, run backpropagation is called reverse mode auto diff, uh, which maybe we'll introduce in another video. But anyway, you can take it uh, for now. That's something the libraries do for us automatically, which is awesome because we don't have to do lots of calculus by hand. Anyway, uh, another thing on top of those core ingredients is usually high-level uh, libraries. And these vary a little bit between uh, different libraries. The one we use in TensorFlow is called Keras. And Keras is excellent. It makes it extremely easy to build uh, many different flavors of neural networks. I love it. I've used it a lot. It's great. And then on top of that, open source libraries have different ecosystems of tools. So I've showed you a couple demos from TensorFlow.js already. And one thing that makes TensorFlow special is that it has an incredibly large ecosystem. So uh, you can develop neural networks in Python and get them running on things like JavaScript, but also you know your phone or even microcontrollers or giant servers. So it's it's a really um, it's a valuable thing to learn. And then before I dive into these uh, code examples, I wanted to mention that we have end-to-end um, -end examples for many many different topics on the website. And if you're curious about these, I would encourage you to uh, to dive in and explore. And um, all of these can take a long time to learn, but uh, I find that at least when I'm reading a paper. Having the complete code is very, very helpful just to make the ideas concrete so I know exactly what the, um, what the authors mean. OK, so now I'd like to show you a little bit of code. And the first thing to know is where to start. So if you're new to TensorFlow, the best tutorial to check out is this one. And you can find a link at the bottom of your screen. And this will show you the smallest possible amount of code you can write to train a neural network to classify images from the Fashion MNIST data set. And instead of um, reading this tutorial uh, to you, I think you can check it out, of course, um, at home on your own. I wanted to highlight just a few parts and create some slides to see if I could add some value. So the first thing to mention is this is the complete code for the neural network. And of course, we're using the high-level API. And as we've talked about, deep learning is code light but concept heavy, meaning while you can write this in you know, three or four lines of code, it will take about six months to understand uh, what all the concepts are in detail. But already, you know a lot of these. So for instance, you can flip back a few slides, and you can understand exactly what's happening inside one of these dense layers. Anyway, one point I'd like to make is that all neural networks are trained iteratively by gradient descent. And basically, uh, while we're training it by gradient descent, we're finding improved values for the weights. The weights are initialized randomly, so the accuracy of our model will begin very low. And over time, you can see as we train it, it gets higher and higher. Of course, there's a trade-off here. And if you train your model too long, it will begin to memorize the training data instead of learning patterns that generalize to the testing data. And you can see this beginning to happen here, where the accuracy on the validation set is lower than the accuracy on the training set. And this is a very important concept called overfitting. And I made some slides to illustrate this a little bit for you. OK, so let's take a look at a couple uh, concepts from that tutorial that are important. And this is a diagram you may have seen before. I'd like to illustrate um, overfitting and underfitting and maybe briefly describe it. And one way to think of machine learning is as a game. And you can imagine you're on your way to a casino. And the game is that the casino is going to generate a number according to some distribution. They're not going to tell you the distribution. They're just going to generate a number. And your job is to predict that number. And they give you some data before you arrive uh, sampled from the distribution. And your job is to find a model that's going to let you accurately predict the future numbers the casino is going to generate. You can imagine that the data set that they handed to you is the training set, and the data containing the numbers they generate is the test set. What makes this hard is you hand the casino your model, and they use your model to see how accurately you're able to predict uh, future values that they sample. So you have to get this right on the first time. 
And basically there's two concepts, there's overfitting and underfitting. And here we're saying that imagine the distribution the casino is sampling from is x squared. And you know, there's some noise, but it's, it's a x squared like distribution. On the left, we're looking at a model that might underfit. And this is a linear model. There's, it's not uh, expressive enough to fit x squared. So it's going to have high error on the training set and it's likely going to have high error on the test set. On the far right of this diagram, we're looking at an extremely complex distribution that perfectly fits the training set. So you would have zero training error or you'd have perfect training accuracy. The downside is if you look at that squiggly line, this, that line that we found doesn't look like x squared. So even though you have perfect accuracy on the training set, you're likely to have very low accuracy when the casino uses your model to predict the data. And in the middle is a model that looks about just right. And you can see that it's making some errors on the training data, but because it looks like x squared, it's likely to do well when we go to gamble. There are many ways to control overfitting and underfitting in deep learning, but the most important one to start with is this parameter called epochs. And this basically says how many rounds of gradient descent we're gonna do. And the idea is that the longer we train for, the more tightly the model is going to fit the training distribution, but the error on test might increase. And uh, we need to find uh, the right length to train for, basically. So here's one way to look at overfitting and underfitting for models that are trained iteratively, uh, like deep neural networks. And you'll see graphs like this uh, pop up a lot in your studies and in tutorials and things like that. And what we're looking at is accuracy on the training and validation set as a function of the number of epochs that we've trained the model for. And you'll see that over time, the accuracy on the training set becomes very high. But what's interesting is you'll see that the accuracy on the validation set flattens out and then begins to decrease. When these graphs diverge, that tells us that the model is overfitting uh, to the training data. If we're in our MNIST world and, or in our fashion MNIST world, and we're classifying images of clothing, what we want the model to learn is that, oh, things like sweatshirts often have uh, strings like this. We want it to learn general features of sweatshirts that are useful to classify new data. If we train for too long, what happens is the model begins to memorize the training set. And it says, oh, a sweatshirt looks exactly like this one I've seen before. And that doesn't help it classify new data. So when these are diverging, that tells you that you're overfitting. And one thing you can basically do is stop training uh, the model when these begin to diverge. And there's different ways to do this. Uh, one thing you can investigate as an exercise is you can look at callbacks. And Keras has a callback called early stopping that you can pass to model.fit to get the model to uh, stop training automatically when this behavior occurs. Okay, so with MNIST out of the way, um, let's take a look at autoencoders. And this is really cool for a couple reasons. I'll show you both a shallow and deep autoencoder with the, you know, by changing one line of code. And I'll also show you how you can use these for anomaly detection, uh, which is super cool. So an autoencoder is a special type of neural network that learns to reproduce its own input. And the reason that I selected this tutorial is I think um, I have a, I'd like to pitch you a good way to learn about different topics in deep learning. So let's say that you're brand new to autoencoders. What I would like to have in your shoes would be complete end-to-end -end code to train an autoencoder. And I'd like a couple different examples. And that's what this tutorial provides. And what's really nice about it is it's actually in the learning more section. It shows you a few different things. The first is an interactive example that I'll show you in a moment, a real world use case, and additional references you can use to learn more, including some academic background. But basically, if we just run this tutorial for one second, which I'm going to do by runtime and run all, I'd like to, um, I'm not going to walk you through the whole thing because you can definitely read this on your own, but I'd like to just say a few different words about what it's going to do. So in the first section, um, we train an autoencoder on the fashion MNIST data set. And here you can see the image that is being fed into the autoencoder. And here you can see the image that is being reconstructed. And an important concept is to start thinking about reconstruction error you'll see that it's not a perfect reconstruction of the image. There's a little bit of noise. And that will become important um, in the third part of this tutorial. There's different ways of defining your models in TensorFlow. And so far, you've seen uh, briefly on the slides the sequential uh, model, which lets you define a neural network as a stack of layers. And what's interesting is you can think of an autoencoder as two neural networks cooperating. The first one is an encoder, and its job is to take an image and compress it into a latent space. 
The second network is a decoder, and its job is to decompress the image from the latent space back to the original dimensions. And as you go through this tutorial, you'll learn that an image from Fashion MNIST happens to have 784 pixels. And you'll see that the encoder is taking an image with 700 something pixels and compressing it down to a vector with 64 points. So this is the encoded or the compressed representation of the image. And then the decoder is receiving that and uh, reconstructing the original image. This is called the model subclassing API. It's a little bit like object-oriented programming. And what you'll see is that in the constructor, we're defining the layers, or in this case, actually the models that we're going to use. So we have a model for the encoder and a model for the decoder. And then in the call method, you can see how the data flows through them. So here, X is going to be an image, and you can see that we're passing X through the encoder to get the um, encoded representation. And then we can pass that through the decoder to reconstruct the original image, which we then return. So this is just a really nice um, way that you can, this is a nice code style that you can use to define uh, more advanced models like this. What's interesting is you can still train this model with something like model.fit, um, exactly like uh, how you would train something in the beginner's collection. Of course, there's ways around this in TensorFlow too if you'd like to do something fancier. But what's really cool, using the high-level APIs, we can train an autoencoder with just a few lines of code, which is a great way to get started. The second example uses an autoencoder to denoise images. And this is a really cool use case, um, but it's actually not the one that I'm excited to talk about. So I'll let you read through this one on your own. The basic idea is that you create a noisy version of the image. And here we're taking something from the Fashion MNIST dataset, and we're applying a, uh, some random noise to it. And then we train the autoencoder to uh, reproduce the original image without the noise, which is really cool. One point that I'd like to briefly make is autoencoders are not limited to dense layers. And so we haven't talked about convolution in this talk, but here you'll see that we're defining a, um, an encoder using convolutional layers, which are a type of layer well suited to image processing. And here we're defining a decoder also using convolutional layers. Um, this convolutional 2D transpose is basically a learned upsampling. But you can see the basic idea is the same regardless of the type of layers. We're creating a compressed representation and then we're decoding it. The example that I'd really like to talk about is anomaly detection. And I'll do so using an interactive demo. And you can find a link to that at the very bottom of this collab. Uh, let's open it up now. And what we're looking at here is a data set of electrocardiograms. And the basic idea in this demo is that you can draw some sort of hypothetical ECG. And after you draw it, the model will attempt to predict whether it's normal or abnormal. And if you look on the right here, the blue line corresponds to the input that I drew. So this is the input signal, and that is what is fed through an encoder. The prediction is the dark red line here, and that is the output of a decoder. So the idea is that we feed the ECG through an encoder and then try and reconstruct that same signal using a decoder. If you look at the light red here, this is the error, and that's the difference between the input and the reconstructed output. Now here's the intuition for how we could use this for anomaly detection. You could imagine that if you have a large data set of ECGs, let's say that almost all of them are normal and you have a small number of anomalous examples. Then if you train an autoencoder on that, because the encoder and the decoder see so many more examples of normal ECGs, they have an easier time um, compressing them and reconstructing them. But when the encoder sees an abnormal ECG, like the one that I've read, because it's outside of the distribution that it's used to, it has a more difficult time compressing it, and then the decoder has much higher reconstruction error. And so we can detect anomalies by looking at the reconstruction error on the decoder, if you're able to collect a training set that has tons of um, uh, normal examples and a small number of anomalous ones. So let's move back to the tutorial for a second. And we actually like the example that I showed you on the website so much. That one happened to be implemented in um, JavaScript, but we re-implemented it in Python using a very similar idea and the same data set. And what's cool is if you go through this tutorial, 
you'll see how you download this data set. And it's, it's, it's a vector of um, something like 140 points corresponding to um, the ECG readings over time. And then you'll see how we import the data set and pre-process it. And there's some code here to display normal examples and abnormal examples from the data set. And what's interesting is we're cheating here a little bit in the sense that this data set is actually supervised. So it has labels for normal and abnormal ECGs, but we're not using those labels when we train our autoencoder. And so here uh, you can actually see that uh, we're training just using dense layers. And right off the bat, you know, as an exercise, if you wanted to, um, because this is time series data, instead of using dense layers, you could explore using RNNs. But we're using dense layers. And just as a remark, this is a deep autoencoder. If you wanted to do a shallow autoencoder, you could simply delete these two layers. And now you have a, um, a shallow encoder and a shallow uh, decoder. But if you want to use the, um, the deep learning, you can put those layers uh, back. It's sort of a funny thing. Deep learning is um, it's concept heavy, but code light. So it takes a long time to learn about exactly what's happening inside ReLU or exactly what the dense layer is doing. But the actual act of you know, writing a deep neural network is, is not very complicated. Anyway, um, what's really cool is after training this, the trick to use it for anomaly detection is we can look at the average reconstruction error. And um, just like the interactive demo, we produce some plots which show you the same thing. And then you can use this autoencoder to detect anomalies by classifying new examples and then basically seeing if the reconstruction error is over a threshold. So for example, if the reconstruction error is you know, greater than you know, maybe one standard deviation above the average reconstruction error on the training set, then you could classify it as an anomaly. Anyway, I know I'm going uh, quickly through this, but as an exercise, what I'd recommend uh, you do is um, visit this tutorial, you know, run through it, play with the code a little bit, and then see if you can use it to help you understand autoencoders by reading it along with uh, the demo and the, the references and the next steps. And that's usually a good strategy to learn about uh, different topics in deep learning. Okay, so I hope this was helpful. And now let's take a look at a couple of uh, book recommendations because you're probably going to want to study uh, for a little while. Um, and again, it takes about a semester to learn this stuff. First of all, for code examples, uh, there's two really good resources, tensorflow.org slash tutorials and keras.io slash examples. And I have three books I'd like to briefly talk about. The one for you depends on what your goals are. Uh, let's start on the left. Uh, the first is Deep Learning with Python. And this is an excellent, excellent book. It's perfect for developers if, if you'd like to learn how to do deep learning in practice. So for example, what's the best way to train an image classifier or a text classifier? And even if you'd like to learn about more advanced topics like GANs, this is a great place to start. What's nice about it is there's uh, very little math. It's primarily hands-on. And this dives directly into neural networks. The second book is called Hands-On Machine Learning. And this is also outstanding. The difference is this starts with classical ML. So if you're new to things like heinous neighbors or decision trees or logistic regression, this will walk you through all of that and then the second half of the book will cover neural networks with TensorFlow. And it uses my two favorite libraries. The first half of the book is taught using scikit-learn. Um, you can't do better, it's outstanding. An important note, um, deep learning libraries are changing all the time as we learn how to make them basically more helpful to you. And it's important that you get the second edition of both of these books, which covers the latest version of TensorFlow. The third book is called Deep Learning. It's, um, it's free of charge. You can find the entire textbook online. And uh, this is perfect if you're a PhD student and you're really interested in the math and the theory. But unlike the other two books, uh, this one has no code. So a good strategy I'd recommend is get one of the other two books, whichever you prefer, and you can uh, use this as a reference if you'd like additional depth or material on any topics that are of interest to you. So thanks very much. I hope this talk was helpful, and I look forward to seeing all of you when we can get back to doing events in person.